Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. The Honorable Chief Justice Charles T. Kennedy presiding. Good morning and welcome to this session of the Florida Supreme Court. On today's docket, we have one case, the case of Wilson Art versus Lopez. Counsel for the petitioner is now recognized. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Sean McDonough from Wilson Elser. With me today is my colleague, Jacqueline Bertelson. We represent the petitioners, Samuel Rosario and his employer, Wilson Art. The facts of this case beg for summary judgment. Mr. Rosario's dash cam video clearly repudiate, repudiated the evidence plaintiff put forth in response to our motion for summary judgment. The 50 CA opinion shows that it wanted to grant summary judgment, but grappled with how to get there. The fifth difficulty was caused by the unworkable standard created by Florida case law interpreting rule 1.510 and the phrase, no genuine issue of material fact. The current standard repeated in Florida law requires the movement to show the non-existence of even the slightest doubt about any material fact. But rule 1.510 uh, plainly requires the movement to show that there is no genuine issue of material, any material fact. So how do we interpret the rules plain language? Uh, obviously the key terms are genuine and material and they were put there for a reason. If the standard was non-existence of slightest doubt, then the rule makers would not have any need for the words genuine and material. Rule 1.510 would just read, judgment sought must be rendered if there is no issue as to any fact. We argue that the current standard that many courts, uh, Florida courts employ uh, ignore the qualifier genuine. The inception of this uh, current standard was Hall versus Talcott, but the Hall standard requi uh, requiring the non-existence of even the slightest doubt runs counter to the plain language of rule 1.510. Hall was significant in that it required the moving party to negate the opponent's case to win motion for summary judgment, and two, to eliminate the slightest doubt that an issue of material fact existed. But rule 1.510 merely said that the judgment must be entered if the record evidence showed that there is no genuine issue of material fact. The counsel, plain, counsel yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how can, how can you say that it's a plain language issue when Florida courts and federal courts at different times have taken sort of, you know, different views of what a genuine issue is? You know, it seems like the Florida federal court went a certain way. And then obviously there was, you know, the mid eighties kind of uh, adoption of the standards that the federal courts apply now. And Florida courts seem to be, you know, you can kind of find cases that describe it differently. So how do you, how did, how does, how is that a plain language issue? Well, I think that um, that, that, that goes to the heart of the issue is about uh, whether this court would have to recede from Hall versus Talcott and, and go with the federal uh, court's interpretation of, um, of the no genuine issue of material fact. Um, I, you know, I can't explain why um, at different times there are different um, in, interpretations, but I know that the plain, just going by the plain language of the rule, uh, you, you would not have any need for the term genuine if it was what the current standard is saying, no slightest doubt. Um, so, you know, I, it wasn't, a, you know, the, the federal court also went 20, 30 years without um, um, really looking at it from a, uh, a plain language standpoint. Um, so, so I, I mean, and it seems like when the federal courts finally settled on the standard they have now, it wasn't so much that they were claiming that the words had some clear meaning. It, it seemed like it was more, uh, that they interpreted the words in light of the purpose of summary judgment, the overall sort of purpose of the rules. And, it, and you know, it seems more pragmatic. I mean, obviously, that's not a comment on the merits of the federal standard, which, you know, seems to make a lot of sense. But I'm just looking at it from an interpretive perspective and wondering, you know, how would we, what would the argument be that we would say, I understand kind of if you're looking at it almost in a prospective sort of legislative rulemaking kind of way, but how would we say now after, you know, decades of Florida courts kind of being all over the map on what this means and coalescing around this notion that 
Florida has this, you know, more demanding standard than the federal standard. How would we come out and say now, oh, the plain meat, the quote unquote plain meaning has been there all along and it happens to be exactly what the federal standard is? I think you do that because the, um, um, the, the very fact that Florida courts are having difficulty understanding how to employ Hall versus Talcott shows that Hall versus Talcott was clearly erroneously held. Um, and I think the, the, the issue with the, Hall versus Talcott could be a situation in which bad facts make bad law. Um, you had a situation in Hall versus Talcott where the, the doctor um, uh, submitted a very conclusory uh, allegations to try to show that there was no genuine issue of fact. And perhaps the Hall court maybe overreached and, and did not uh, keep in mind um, not only the, the, the plain language of the, of the rule, but also the fact that rule 1.010, which is part of rule 1.510, um, actually would tell you to construe rule 1.510 to secure the just, speedy, and inexpensive de determination of any action. I think what we, we have seen since Hall versus Talcott and its progeny is a, 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 an indication that we're not getting just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of every action. And I think that Hall missed the opportunity to, to bring rule 1.010 and how it tells uh, us to construe these rules. It missed the opportunity to, uh, to keep that in mind, the just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of every action. So can you talk about this particular case? I mean, so, you know, I've seen the video. I suspect my colleagues have seen the video. It, it seems to support the, you know, what, what you've said, but obviously the folks on the other side have, you know, have a different uh, argument as to what, what the supposedly, you know, genuine issues that are in dispute would be. And so can you address that? Yes. Um, so, in the trial court level and in the, in the, in the, um, at the 5th DCA, the real issue at play was definitely, does the video evidence uh, contradict the eyewitness testimony, which, and, and the theory from that eyewitness testimony that the sudden, uh, there was a sudden lane change to the left from the center lane by Mr. Rosario, um, which as it turns out, is completely repudiated by Mr. Rosario's own dash cam video, which has him going for 44 seconds straight in the um, in the center lane and slowing to a stop in front of other vehicles that are stopping at an intersection um, it, before he gets impacted by Mr. Lopez. Um, so now, and 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 I think. Now here at this level, at the Supreme Court level, is for the first time we're hearing from the respondent that there's this idea of the negligence per se of Mr. Rosario uh, based on the idea that, that there, there's one portion of their expert's affidavit that, uh, that indicates that the box truck driven by Mr. Rosario was straddling the right lane. Um, I think the video, uh, so so now I'm you know at the trial court level I'm dealing with an ex you know a, a sudden lane change to the left, and now in front of uh, of your honors I'm I may be dealing with a oh he's straddling the right lane and he's per se negligent for straddling the right lane. My my response to that is is that there is no sudden and unexpected movement by uh, Mr. Rosario as clearly shown in the affidavit. The um, um, there are four rec uh, four explanations recognized in in the rear end presumption uh, um, situation uh, of um, excuses for a rear driver not uh, who may be fulfilling his obligations but nonetheless still rear ended the uh, the, the, the the lead driver. Uh, let me step back because I think it, it requires some discussion of Clampett which um, talks about the rear driver's obligations. And the rear driver's obligations are to remain alert, follow the vehicle in front of him at a safe distance, you know, have an imaginary clear stopping distance, and um, 
And the reason for this is that the rear driver is in control of his own following distance. Um, the, 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 the front driver isn't in control of that, the rear driver is. So the, rec the, the, the four um, instances or explanations for why a rear driver can rebut the, the rear end presumption are based on the idea that the rear driver could fulfill his obligations to be alert and keep a safe following distance, yet because of things that have happened in front of him, um, the, uh, he can't, um, he, he, he rear ends nonetheless. So um, in this case, the, um, um, you, the in, in this case, the rear, um, the, the video clearly indicates that for 44 seconds, if you take the expert at his word, at, at, you know, his opinion um, that he's straddling the right lane, he's doing so for 44 seconds. Um, he, and, um, and, and I say, I, I dare say you can look at the video and see that he is driving straight as an arrow. So that means for 44 seconds, Mr. Riz Mr. Rosario was, is perhaps, if we take it in the light most favorable to the to the respondent, driving uh, driving in the in the in the in the right lane. However, that is not the proximate cause for why Mr. Lopez rear-ended him. Um, it it is not a fifth scenario to recognize. Um, it's not a sudden lane change. It's not a sudden stop. It's not an illegal or improper stop. And it's not Mr. Lopez having a mechanical failure. Um, there is nothing in the actions of Mr. Rosario that would cause Mr. Lopez not to be able to just stop. And, as other vehicles were stopping for the red light, Mr. Lopez failed to stop as other vehicles stopped. It, it oh wasn't because- well, that, that sounds- um, that sounds what, what you've just given uh, would would be a magnificent ar argument at a motion for directed verdict. Um, what difference should there be under your rule, if any, between the the court's inquiry at summary judgment and the court's inquiry upon a motion for directed verdict? I, I our position would be there would be no um, there would be no difference between directive verdict and, and summary judgment. Um, uh, certainly there's no difference in the federal courts uh, uh, between that. Um, and there's one of the main, one, one good reason why there shouldn't be a difference is because of uh, rule 1.010 and the idea of uh, a just speedy and inexpensive determination. Um, there is no different standard at direct verdict. It, 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 and, and, and why are we having parties, um, like in this instance, we would be, if we, if we uh, sum, if summary judgment wasn't granted, then we would have to go through the time and expense of going to a jury, uh, pre pre uh, pre presenting a case before a jury, uh, and dealing with the judge's time, um, and and that runs counter to rule 1.010. So, so one McDonald, way, um, go ahead. Mr. McDonald, I'll oh, go ahead. We have, we have uh, nowadays, there seems to be a video camera on it just about everywhere. Uh, so I suspect that in the future, uh, these video uh, cameras and their recordings are gonna be, play a major role in these decisions. When I'm, when I'm watching, I just know about these things, what I see on TV, what I read about. And it seems to me that in each instance where a video camera captures whatever the issue is, there's a counter argument that the video has been tampered with. Uh, what happens in situations in a motion for summary judgment where you have a, a video depicting everything that, that happened, but then encountering the motion for summary judgment there's an affidavit from an expert on videology, whatever you call it, saying that this particular video has been tampered with. And I guess the, the point is, that how far can a trial judge go uh, in not accepting these counter and, and uh, counter affidavits in order to find that there's no genuine issue of material fact? I, I think I think that you a trial judge would have to be faced with a situation where there's no genuine issue of material fact that the video is not somehow tampered or altered with. I think that would be an issue. It was not an issue in this case. 
Um, but I, uh, it, it just seems it just seems to me that 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 position is requiring trial judges to make a lot of factual findings, taking a lot away from juries in order to arrive at this decision. Well, I think in often the cases that the parties admit that that the video has not been tampered with or altered in any way. I think that you'll be dealing with rare instances where another side, the non-moving side may say, wait a second, that was tampered with and you can't rely on this video. So I think in those rare instances where the parties are not agreeing that the video is tampered with, is not tampered with, or is tampered with, that that would be an issue that would prevent summary judgment. Now, the other issue, I'm sorry. Yeah, so you are now into your rebuttal time. You may keep going if you wish, but you are consuming rebuttal time. Thank you, Justice. Let me make one point. There's also the issue of whether there's an interpretation issue of the video. I understand in the Wiggins case that there was an interpretation issue. I don't think you have not heard from the respondents in this case that there's any interpretation issue with the video on a material issue of fact. The only issue is the affidavit of the expert saying that it looks like Mr. Rosario is in the right lane, but I'm taking that fact as true for the purposes of a summary judgment motion, and I'm not contesting that, and I feel I can show that there's no proximate causation. So we don't have an issue here of an altered video. We don't have anyone having an interpretation issue with the video, and as a result, this is a case where it's clear that summary judgment, it just, it should be granted in some shape or form. Thank you. All right, counsel for the respondent. Good morning. May it please the court, Brian Gowdy on behalf of Mr. Lopez and his brother's estate. I want to start with, I heard questions from Justice Meneese about interpretation and from Justice Correale about what the rules should be, whether it should be the same as the directed verdict, and I want to emphasize, as I think my brief does, those are two completely different questions. As Justice Gorsuch has noted, the legislative power involves deciding what the law should be for everyone in the future, and in writing that sentence, the justice emphasized the word should. This today is a judicial dispute, not a legislative rulemaking proceeding, and I represent Mr. Lopez in that dispute, and I will confine my arguments to what the law is, not what I think or Mr. Lopez think the law should be, which would be something appropriate in this court's rulemaking legislative authority. I want to point out to the court, though it's not been discussed so far, that there are four preliminary issues that the court needs to address before it gets to the issue of what is the meaning of Rule 1.510 that are laid out in our brief. First, does this court have jurisdiction? The DCA did not pass upon its should question below, and I would point the court to its precedent in Saugat v. State, which is cited on page 17 of our brief, and is similar to this case. In Saugat, the first DCA there asked whether a standard jury instruction was correct in light of a then recent precedent of this court, and it never answered that question, and this court correctly dismissed the case, saying that the first DCA had not passed upon the question, and then on its own motion, this court issued an order withdrawing the standard jury instruction, and what the court of appeal, what the district court has asked here is, should there be an exception to the present summary judgment standards? That is a quintessential legislative question within this court's rulemaking authority. There was no, there was no interpretive method employed below to ask whether this court's prior precedents interpreting Rule 1.510 were mistaken, or as Justice Kennedy has put it in an opinion, whether there was a serious interpretive legal error, or as this court did when it adopted Justice Thomas's view in Poole, whether there was a demonstrable error, 
There was no analysis of that below. And I would submit this court needs to insist that if the district courts of appeal think the law should be changed, they should not do so in a legislative manner, make that suggestion, but in the manner of pointing out perhaps interpretive mistakes by this court's predecessors. And there was no briefing on that below. Um, related to that, you have heard extensive argument today uh, on the Hall decision, H-O-L-L. Uh, you will not find that decision cited once in any of the briefs below. Um, it was never argued. And in fact, this case doesn't fall under Hall at all. Hall deals with a moving party's burden uh, at summary judgment. Uh, it's undisputed here, uh, and I will concede that the petitioner met its burden uh, in moving for summary judgment. The issue here falls under the Anderson and Matushitu cases of the trilogy about whether the non-moving party met its burden. Counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you give us the textual argument for how um, for the way Florida law appears to have interpreted the concept of a genuine issue, how is that consistent with the text? Sure. So the, the, the text, as you say, is the gen, genuine issue of material fact. So I think that you would first start what, what is the ordinary meaning of those words. And as we, as we did in our brief, we looked, as we noted, we looked for dictionaries that were contemporaneous to 1950, because that's when this uh, rule was adopted. It was common law rule 43 at that time. And uh, I have, and nobody has cited to this court, I have found no dictionary uh, contemporaneous to that time defining a genuine issue of material fact, that phrase. You'll find the word genuine, uh, which uh, means really the same thing it does today. So as we've laid out in our brief, uh, I think that, you know, and I know Justice Muniz, you've written about this, you really need to look at the old soil canon, as well as the canon that's laid out in Sutherland's about when a one jurisdiction adopts another jurisdiction's rule. And you, and you don't look at how the, the original jurisdiction interpreted the rule 36 years later. You look how the original jurisdiction interpreted the rule at the time of adoption. And the only cases that have been submitted to this court in the, what I would call the adoption period, which would be the you know, 1940s, 1950s, uh, all of them use the standard that Florida courts are using today. Um, Although it seems complicated because I think, I can't remember if it was Anderson or the, or the Matsushita case, but when, when the court there was explaining their understanding of the concept of a genuine issue, they were citing a case from 1874 that was rejecting what appears to be now the Florida, you know, any possible evidence standard. So if we view it as kind of a legal term of art, you know, as it existed in the 1950s, it seems like already there was, there was in the, in the soil, there was already kind of precedent for treating it more like what the federal courts do now. I, I would disagree with your reading in those cases, Justice Muniz. Yeah, I think you're referring to an 1871 decision from the U.S. Supreme Court that dealt with directed verdict. And uh, the question that was asked by Judge Coriel about whether it should be the same, as a policy matter today, the court may wanna decide it should be. But historically, uh, the directed verdict rule and the summary judgment rule did not grow up together. Well, I guess my, just to Clark, because I have the same question for you that I had for opposing counsel, which is uh, what, what is the logical difference between the judicial inquiry at summary judgment and at directed verdict. My question isn't what should it be in some hypothetical uh, you know, way, uh, it's what is it in fact and what is the rule you are advocating that it ought to be? That's the question. Well, I'm not advocating what it ought to be. I'm advocating what it is. Well, but you, uh, but you are, right? You're, you're, you're asking the court to adopt a rule and I'm not talking about policy. I'm not talking about you know, legislation, I'm saying what, tell me about the rule, the, the, the holding that you advocate for and whether under that holding there is any logical difference between the judicial project at summary judgment and at directed verdict. Sure, I, I ask you to apply principles of textualism and originalism. Directed verdict came into the law in the late 1600s. 
uh, was always a concept that was used after a jury trial. The uh, summary judgment rule in contrast, while there is there was one rule in 1732 in Virginia, it did not develop in the law until the second half of the 19th century. The first time it appeared really was 1855 in England. So by the time you got to 1938, when the federal courts adopted the summary judgment rule, they also adopted a separate rule for directed verdict. So textually, if you wanted these two rules to be the same, you would have expected the do adopters in 1958 to adopt the language and then rule 50, which is still more or less the same today, into rule 56. They did not do that. They adopted two distinct rules. And this court in 1950 followed that pattern. If you look at the common law rules that were adopted in 1950, there was a common law rule 40 and a common law rule 43. Their descendants today are rule 1.480 and rule 1.510. Textually, these rules are quite distinct. The rule 1.480, which used to be common law rule 40, just uses the words, your honor, directed verdict. It doesn't say anything else when you go back and read that rule. The reason was is that concept was well established in the common law at that time. And that would include the 1871 or 74 case that Justice Muniz was talking about. Uh, summary judgment was a relatively new concept that came around in the, in the second half of the 19th century. It was actually originally used mainly by plaintiffs in business litigation in order to speed up getting a case to trial by striking sham defenses. So historically, contextually and textually, these two rules are different. So if you're going to follow textualism and originalism, I don't see how they can be the same. Now, but isn't so if you look at Anderson though they're say, they're saying the court has said that summary judgment should be granted where the evidence is such that it would require a directed verdict for the moving party and it's citing a case from 1944 so shouldn't I mean isn't that shouldn't that inform how the ter how the term of art was understood in the 1950s right I, I I what I'm aware of that 1944 case and reviewed it last night I the the overwhelming weight of authority, in the 1940s, Your Honor, which I have cited in my brief, used the slightest doubt standard. The lead case from that time was um, from the Second Circuit. Um, I think it's called Arnstein. Uh, I have it cited in my brief. And uh, I cited cases from multiple other federal circuit courts uh, in, the, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And so when I was in Justice Muniz, I understand your argument but you're, you're here on whether to overturn precedent. And therefore, you're gonna, they're going to have to make a showing that there was demonstrable error. And so I don't see how the, our courts in the early 1950s, and I, I trace decisions all the way back to shortly after the adoption uh, with the slightest doubt standard, how, they, how that could have been a demonstrable error when they were doing the same thing as the Federal Circuit Courts of Appeals were doing. Um, uh, Perhaps back then, uh, Justice Muniz, they could have gone the directed verdict route, but they didn't. And so uh, if you're going to act as a judicial body in this proceeding, I think you cannot make, that you cannot show there was some serious interpretive error. As, as you pointed out, Justice Muniz, um, the courts have had different interpretations of these phrases. Uh, there was no clear dictionary definition. The rule that can, was, I, can I can I interrupt you um, yeah. just briefly? So yeah. I, I I agree with you that that if if we're saying that the rule is wrong because it doesn't it doesn't lead to the just and timely resolution of cases, that's a policy making thing, completely. If, if the, the the only argument for going back and changing the old standard to a new standard would have to be that our precedent is clearly erroneous. So I, I agree with your argument there. And, and you have a compelling argument for why it's not clearly erroneous um, based on the, the originalist and textual pe principles. My question is, is there a, another way to, to look at the case? And that is that um, when we put the rule in place, there, I mean, video evidence was not really a thing. What you would have had and when this standard was adopted was the driver testifying to what he thought was true the eyewitness testifying to what he thought was true. And clearly nobody would say under any standard that summary judgment would be appropriate. But, 
But now the courts are dealing with a case where there is evidence that is not questioned in terms of its reliability. There's a video camera and there's no suggestion that it's been tampered with, the video has been tampered with, that, that decides the case. And that kind of evidence, it doesn't seem like, was contemplated. So, so I mean, it, we, we're really applying the rule, in a sense, to a fact pattern that is very common today, but that wasn't really contemplated as common at the time. Is there room for um, a, a different application without going back and switching the standard? I know it's a long question. I'm sure the chief will give you more time because I took so much of yours, but. I like the long questions, Your Honor. Um, I think uh, uh, the answer to your question is no. Um, if you send this to the rulemaking process and this rule may last another 70 years, and, and I don't think anyone on this Zoom call can predict what the technology will be like in 70 years. I mean, we see this in the Fourth Amendment, right? I mean, it's just said unreasonable searches and seizures, yet uh, Justice Scalia was able to apply that when you're dealing with a device that could uh, determine the amount of heat in your home and make the determination. I don't think the technology here changes a thing, Justice Lawson. Uh, it, you're always going to be grappling with this. Um, and I and I just want to be clear I am that uh, our expert. Uh, in other words, I mean, the, the, the sort of line of reasoning would be that that the eyewitness testimony doesn't create a genuine issue material fact in light of the video that's not questioned in terms of its reliability, has it been tampered with that kind of thing? Well, I think, uh, I think uh, anytime you're gonna look at the, the if, if well, here's part of the problem I have, this case has been set up in a way that's factually false. There is not an inconsistency between our expert's opinion and the video. Um, the inconsistency in the in between Mr. Mendez's testimony and the video deals with the timing of the impact. Our expert did not rely on that portion of Mr. Mendez's testimony. What he relied upon was on the movement of the vehicle, which is in you can see that in paragraph seven and eight of the expert's affidavit. And, the, and by the way, there's another video not in the record uh, of Mr. Um, uh, from the dash cam of Mr. Mendez that was his reference in the expert's affidavit. But the, so the issue here is whether the vehicle, uh, and by the way, we never argued sudden lane change in our response to the motion for summary judgment, not once. And they haven't refuted that. So look at page 184 of the record and go forward. We cited on page 186, the traffic statute they violated. If you look closely at the video and you uh, know that the, and as it's been attested to by the expert, the video was near the center line of the vehicle. And if you look, you'll see, you can see a heck of a lot more to the right than you can of the left. You can't see down the left side of the vehicles in front of you. You can see well down the right side of the vehicles in front of the Rosario dash cam. So we don't have a conflict. If you look at paragraph eight. But Mr. Gotti, Mr. Gotti, are you saying that even if you were in, in federal court applying a federal standard, then summary judgment should still be denied? Correct. And that's my entire argument three. And so this would all be dicta if you decide to rule on the standard in this case. I believe that all out in argument three. This case, it's not a Hall case. It has nothing to do with Hall, which is why the petitioners never argued it below nor did the fifth DCA rely on it. It's not a sudden lane change case. That's a fiction created by the petitioners. If you go read our response to the motion for summary judgment, we never argued once a sudden lane change. We argued the, the statute, it's on page 186 of the record, and that it had been violated over the lane. And it's the, the expert's opinion was that if you look at the video, like I just described, I won't go through it again. I've watched it a hundred times probably, You'll, you'll, you'll be able to see that it looks like he's off center. At least there's a genuine issue of material fact there under the federal or state standard. And then uh, the, the way that the vehicle was hit was on the right rear side and that caused it to move to the left. 
And, you know, we only have to prove here that Mr. Rosario was 1% at fault. Counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you because your time's getting short. Could we ask you a forward-looking question? So if we, if we think about kind of the wisdom, the words are what they are. The federal's on the page, the federal standard and the Florida standard seem like they're, you know, pretty much the same. Obviously, in case law, they aren't. If you look at sort of the wisdom of the federal system and the overwhelming approach of other states, the current Florida standard seems indefensible. And I'm curious if you could help us think through prospectively why that impression would not be accurate. Uh, I have to, I'll try to make two points to you about that, Your Honor. First, the, rule, the language, I disagree with the premise of your question. Uh, rule 56E, which was- The 56E thing, they still, it still circles back to genuine issue. And the 56E thing only relates to not being able to rely on your pleading. So the 56E thing, I, I don't think helps you. So what's the second point? Okay. The second point is that the, there's a lot of other differences between the Florida and federal rules, especially with respect to the procedures about how summary judgment is done. As you saw in this case, the video wasn't even presented until the day of the hearing, which was a violation of the rule to which we should have objected to below. Be that as it may, uh, a responding party only has to present the evidence two days before the hearing. The moving party has to present it 20 days before the hearing. If you look, and I do a lot of federal practice, uh, both Rule 56 and the the corresponding local rules, which trial courts in Florida can't have local rules under Section 2A, um, they, they lay out a very detailed process for bringing this to the judge. And you have two briefs, one from, uh, I think, 14 retired judges with 309 years of experience and an organization that represents both plaintiffs and defense trial lawyers urging you to send this to the committee to make a holistic change and not just some change to the standard, which won't fit with the rest of the rule. I see that I'm over my time. Uh, so you can, you, uh, I'll give you another um, uh, minute. Okay, well, does, I would like to answer any questions if anyone has those. Um, I do, I do wanna just point out uh, uh, the other issues in the brief. Um, I, I've already pointed out that that was never passed upon. I, I haven't heard any argument about that. I don't see how this court has jurisdiction if you're going to actually enforce the passed upon provision. Um, if you do determine you have jurisdiction, it's it's all based on a false set of facts that have been set out. the The main thing in the 50 say opinion that is just is just incorrect uh, is it is it says that the uh, expert's opinion was based in large part on the deposition testimony of Mr. Mendez. That's false. Uh, it was in paragraph eight, his testimony was based on his viewing of the Rosier drive cam. I so counsel, is there, so if you sort of start from the premise of Justice Lawson's question, if the 50 CA here had said, is there an exception under existing Florida law for, you know, video evidence? I mean, which obviously that was that was in, implicitly at least passed on by the 50 CA. I mean, isn't that basically what what we're being asked to decide? If you focus not on the perspective but on the if the they change the question to put it as if I mean, we tweak the questions all the time. I mean, basically what they're saying is we're looking at existing Florida law and we don't perceive there to be an exception. But understanding the type of question that Justice Lawson asked, maybe there is. Maybe the video have maybe. This the idea of a scintilla or you know no possible evidence needs to be looked at in light of this you know video differently than we would if it were two you know affidavits competing with each other. You tweak the question though after you determine you have jurisdiction. You can't tweak the question to manufacture jurisdiction. If you were allowed to do that, then that may that would allow the court to just create its own jurisdiction. So I think the the wording of the question is important. And more importantly, Justice Muniz, and maybe this goes more to the discretionary part, this court would be, would be better served and should send a message to the district courts of appeal that if they think the law was wrongly interpreted in a judicial manner, then there ought to be some textual analysis in the opinion 
to guide this court. There was virtually no textual analysis done here until my answer brief and one of the eight amicus briefs. So I think it's important to send the message to the courts, the district courts about uh, counsel, what- Counsel, you need to go ahead and sum up in about 15 seconds. Uh, I just want to point out the last point uh, I made was that uh, none of these arguments were preserved below. I cited uh, opinions by, by many of you uh, making the point that this court does not act as standby counsel for, uh, for counsel. And I would ask that the court affirm or dismiss in the, in the alternative, if you do change the summary judgment standard, I think due process requires that Mr. Lopez have the ability to present the additional evidence he has and that that be heard by the trial judge in the first instance, not by this court. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will hear a rebuttal. You need to unmute counsel. Thank you, your honors. Um, first of all, um, the, the 50 CA, or, or I should say that the issue of um, the sudden lane change uh, theory was very much argued at the summary judgment hearing by by the uh, by the prior count, uh, for the by the respondent. Um, I do think that the 58 DCA did pass on this question in that um, it was faced with um, Scott versus Harris, the the a federal case. Uh, inter interpreting using the federal standard, which is what I relied upon in my um, in my um, motion for summary judgment at the trial court level. Um, so the issue of the federal court standard was very much a part of this uh, case from the the time I actually filed my motion for summary judgment. And in fact, Judge Lambert at at um, at oral arguments and at the fifth DCA was uh, asking me quite a bit of questions about uh, the federal standard. Um, so, um, but I want to get to the contextual uh, argument and, and how, um, it, it, to me, it's clear that genuine issue, how does that get to the hall and its progeny idea of no existence of slightest doubt? Um, if the, if the, the, the rule makers wanted to have that as the standard, that would, why would they have put in genuine? They, in fact, they could have been even more clear about no. The, Mr. Mr. McDonough, yes. uh, let me, I, I think, so you're asking us to recede from prior precedent interpreting the rule, correct? Correct. And, and correct. so I, I think what you would need to do under our precedent is demonstrate that it's clearly erroneous. So if, if you could sort of more narrowly focus on why, not just why you might view it differently, but why our precedent is clearly erroneous, that would be helpful. Yes, and, and 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 I, the one way I try to do it is by just looking at the plain meaning of, of the of the of the word, um, and and then I look to um, things such as um, you know superfluous. What if 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 the the standard was no the exist no existence of slightest doubt, then genuine would be superfluous. It, you wouldn't need it in the. Do you, do you have a response to to? your opponent's um, more textualist, originalist view of the rule? Yes, I, 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 for, for one, I, I question whether um, textualism applies as strongly when you are interpreting um, a, a rule that was promulgated by this court as opposed to um, uh, statutes and constitutions that were promulgated by another um, governmental body. Um, and then um, does going back to the time when the rule was drafted have as much significance when interpreting a rule that was promulgated by this very court okay. I, versus I think interpreting- if, if you're saying that, um, that courts should have, a court that has rulemaking authority should have more leeway in interpreting its own rules, then I, I, I would think that that would lead to a conclusion that it'd be harder to determine that the original interpretation was clearly erroneous. Um, well, correct. I mean, well, I think that the reason why uh, you could say that Hall versus Talcott was cl clearly erroneous was because it never considered the idea that Rule 1.010 was made part of that rule, and um, and 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 I think that Judge um, Rehnquist uh, touched on that 
when he um, when he decided Celotex, um, he pointed out that it you know summary judgment was not a disfavored procedural shortcut, but rather uh, as an integral part of the federal rules as a whole, which are designed to to secure the just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of every action, which is exact same that's that, that's rule that's federal rule one, which is the exact same as um, the Florida rule 1.010. And you go to the, um, the rule of construction that um, when, when the, the federal um, rule and the state rule are substantially similar that you can look to federal courts at, for persuasiveness. So that's, uh, it, it's, it's the, it's, it's the, ignoring of rule 1.010 that uh, supports the idea that Hall is uh, clear, clearly erroneous. And then- okay, Council, you are, you are now over your time. However, since other opposing counsel went over by about three minutes, I'll give you another minute and a half, which will put you even. Thank you. Um, so, um, Let me just, in, 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 in closing, just uh, summarize what we're, what we're asking the court to do. Um, we're asking the court to overturn the 50 CA and affirm the trial court summary judgment. It's just, how do you do that? Number one, you could go back and say, um, agree with my argument at, at the trial court level that the, the evidence, the video evidence made the eyewitness testimony and even the expert affidavit um, um, not competent or substantial because it clearly repudiated um, that evidence. Or you could go uh, with the federal, uh, with the 58 DCA certified question, um, which took into consideration the fact that back when this rule uh, was, was uh, promulgated that video evidence was not in existence. And so there's a modernization, so to speak, of the, of the interpretation of the rule uh, because of, of video that, that could clearly and um, that could clearly repudiate um, uh, a non-moving party's evidence. And then um, also you can do like the, the federal court uh, did um, in 1986 and, um, and change your interpretation of the phrase, no genuine issue of material facts, such that it has its plain meaning um, not some meaning like no, no slightest doubt um, and makes it more in line with rule 1.010, just like Judge Rehnquist did with federal rule one. All right. Uh, anyway, thank you. All right. We thank you uh, both for uh, your arguments in this case today. That's the only case on the docket. So the proceedings today are concluded.